it is truly difficult to leave behind the north of Jordan, especially in March when it's so beautiful and green. It is simply difficult not to stop every five minutes to wonder at another marvelous view. If we only had an extra week to just walk around, taking it all in slowly, uh, kilometer by kilometer. Unfortunately, we do not have an extra week and it's time to move on. So we leave behind Irbit and Gerash and we go to the other side of the capital. Northeast of the Dead Sea is a town called Madaba. It is a perfect setting for another piece of the Jordanian puzzle. Time to talk about Christianity. And we will do it not only in the town of Madaba itself, but we will keep on jumping around as there are plenty of other interesting places to visit. And we're going to talk a bit about modern life, but especially the old times. Now, the topic of Christianity actually popped up several times in other episodes, and I mentioned that, generally speaking, Christians live with their Muslim neighbors in peace. But sometimes there were conflicts. Late 19th century, in a city in the south, Karak, there was a strife between Bedouin um, tribes. Turns out, some of those tribes were Christians. Yep, I say Bedouins, we automatically think Muslims, not only. Around 90 families, both Catholic and Orthodox, guided by two priests of the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem, went up north. And they found a place called a Tel. Tel is basically an um, artificial hill that was created by hundreds of sometimes thousands of years of human settlement. And they started living around it. Some of them kept their Bedouin way of life, but some of them decided to become farmers and they settled down on top of the hill, building their churches and houses. But because Tel is an artificial hill made of human settlement, when they started building houses, they started everywhere finding traces of old life. They started finding mosaics. And already here you have the highlight. So 150 years later, there is this place, um, the offices of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem. And right next to the offices, you will find their main church of Saint George, which is one of the earliest churches built here. And straight up, when they started building it, they found what is today considered the highlight of Madaba. And that's why you see plenty of people, not only outside, mm. there's a bit of a line inside as well, but it is absolutely worth waiting. Welcome to the map of Madaba. It is a huge mosaic, 21 meters per 7 meters originally. Not all of it survived, but quite a lot as it is today, 16 meters per 5 meters. There are also some, let's call it, white places on the map, but generally speaking, 70% of it is there for us to see. Although, when it was discovered late 19th century, more of it was there still. Straight up, the discoverers um, sent messages to the Patriarchate in Jerusalem about their discovery, and guess what? Nothing happened for 80 years. They actually destroyed a bit of it by building the church, by not caring about it, so it took 80 years. In the 60s of the 20th century, Volkswagen, the car company, paid some experts and they started saving the mosaic from further degradation. That's why before entering the church, I showed you the offices of the Patriarchate. If you are in Madaba, go there and wave your fist at them for those 80 years of doing nothing. And now, of course, they charge the tickets, right? And then when you see a Volkswagen car, give it a pat, give it a kiss for saving, for saving this marvelous mosaic that's in front of you right now. And basically, it is the map of the Holy Land. So modern Israel and Palestine, we will also have the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and what is today Western Jordan. Maybe the most interesting detail here is that the map is rather accurate, especially when it comes to relations between the cities or natural um, points that are shown on the map. So in modern times, they used it several times 
to try to find towns that we know, for example, from the Bible, but they didn't survive to modernity. Great example is the city of Ashkelon, meaning there is modern Ashkelon, but thanks to this map, they found the ruins of the uh, ancient one. Another interesting feature here is plenty of text in Greek. It is a map for pilgrims, hence not only we see towns, but also plenty of descriptions relating us, for example, to the Bible. The focus of the map is the holy city of Jerusalem, which you can straight up see as it is the biggest city on the map and the only one which is not represented symbolically, but realistically. So let's have a look at it and you will see a line from left to right that's the main street the cardo some emblematic buildings are shown as well for example a church from 532 another church from 570 is not shown here which means the map was created between those two dates of course bethlehem is there as well on the side of jerusalem and let's move to the other side of the map for a second this part is not realistic anymore what you see is the delta of the nile and mount sinai mount zion as it is far away from madaba i guess it wasn't that important anymore to show it realistically but it is there officially as part of the holy land let's go back to the more realistic part here you have the dead sea with some ships on it but as it is dead, the fish is trying to swim away from it upriver. And up the river, you will find a very curious bridge. A boat is tied to a rope, spanning the river, connecting both banks. Very smart. And actually, we could stay and talk about the map for a long time. As you can see, there are actual lectures about it. As you have, for example, 150 towns to talk about. 2 million pieces of mosaic were used. Just thinking of it all, that's how I look like. Anyway, silliness aside, let me show you one more place. Jericho surrounded by palm trees and north of it is a name Beth Abara. Let's go towards it for a moment. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land, from Gilead to Dan, all of Nephtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. So, that was the Old Testament. Unfortunately, we couldn't see Jericho because of the fog. Although I have to say, we did see the modern towers of Amman. Another issue was that our poor phones didn't know what to focus on, uh, on the light, on the fog, far, near. So unfortunately, as you saw a moment ago, um, videos of the panoramas are not very good. So let's stick to photos. But in the end, the most important thing, yes, here we are on top of Mount Nebo, where according to the Old Testament, Moses himself had died. Now, I guess you noticed that in the background for a moment you had some chants, which kinda sounded like Catholic monks. And no wonder. Today Mount Nebo is in the hands of the Franciscans, so it was a Franciscan choir singing for you. If you have any doubts, when you enter there's a monument and two languages. There is Arabic, as we are in Jordan, and there is Latin. Now the monument itself is to, um, to peace between the three great religions of the book. And actually, Moses is a very good symbol of the unity, as Moses is important for all three of them, for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as well. So the monument has several languages all around it, and it was erected in the year 2000, because there was kind of an important Polish guy who came here of course, John Paul II did come. There is the olive tree planted by him. Basically, if we are talking about Franciscan, Catholic monks, it was a big deal. 
What you see around you, though, is not Catholic. This is early Byzantine remains. It used to be, as you can see, a big complex. Of course, for the Byzantines, the story of Moses was also very important. Hardly anything is left, only fundaments. The church is, of course, modern, but there is something hidden within the church. I keep saying Indiana Jones is not an archaeologist. Well, this is how they started preparing for archaeological dig in the 30s here. And when they started digging, before constructing the church, they started finding, well, guess what? Mosaics. So you enter the church, it is very modern, but what you see below you, at your feet, this is, this is basically late antiquity. It is 6th, 7th century mosaics, and there is everything you want from them. You will have geometrical ones like we see here, figurative, we're gonna see soon. Mosaics, as always, you have on the floor. Turns out, not only, if I understood right, here they also had mosaics on the walls, as you see in front of you. And let me tell you this, the place is absolutely fabulous. We could stay here for a good 20 minutes, just walking around the church and uh, viewing the mosaics without any commentary. Every other mosaic is more stunning than the previous one. The place is absolutely fantastic. Several hundred years of work of mosaic masters laid in front of you, all around you, beneath your feet. I don't even want to think how many pieces were used. If one Madaba map had two million, here you have tens of millions of pieces. And now I know what you're thinking right now. Those are not mosaics, it's posters. Somebody painted it, right? Nope, those are mosaics. Have a look. If you have any doubts, I guess no doubts anymore. But let's now turn to the official highlight of the place. It is year 531 and three artists, Soel, Kayum and Elijah, during the time of the Bishop of Madaba Elijah as well, created this absolute masterpiece. A beautiful mosaic showing you well, basically showing you animals, but some of them are for hunting and some of them already domesticated, most of them, interestingly enough, from Africa. Unfortunately, the way they laid out the, um, the stairs and the passageways, it is difficult to see it properly from the front, better from the side, although it is from the side not very comfortable. Anyway, it is an absolutely stunning piece of art, a perfect example of the golden age of mosaics in Madaba. I recommend pausing here and just enjoying this piece of art for a minute. So, as I mentioned earlier, we could just stay here for 20 minutes walking around and enjoying all the art, but then again, when we think about it, if this is a place where Moses died, it is obviously a very important spot for the Byzantines as well, so the best art is here, but we are going to leave the place and go down the Mount Nebo to another very important spot, as the death of Moses is not the end of the story of Israelites. Let us turn to the Old Testament again. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adan in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan 
and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. So again, that was the Old Testament, and guess what? 3000 years later, we are also here on dry ground in the middle of what should be the Jordan River. Anyway, we are here for a number of reasons. First of all, on the Madaba map, I showed you this Beth Abara. Now this means literally house of passage or house of crossing. So that's the place where, according to tradition, the Israelites under Jesua crossed the river Jordan. On the map, it is shown on the west side of the river. Well, doesn't matter. They had to cross to the west from the east. But maybe more importantly, several hundred years later, there is a prophet called Elijah. And he crossed the river as well from a hill. Uh, on the eastern side, he was taken um, by chariots of fire straight to heaven. And the hill of Elijah is still there. Unfortunately for us, it was closed, so we couldn't visit the place itself. But still more importantly, several hundred years later, at least according to Christian tradition, the descendant of Elijah came here and lived in uh, the caves of the hill. One John the Baptist. So now let's turn to the New Testament. According to the Gospel of Mark, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And here we are. This is one of the most important places in the world for at least 1.5 billion people. This is the very place where, according to tradition, John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan. Unfortunately, not much is left of the original complex, as you saw. There are churches around here, but they are all modern. It is actually possible that the original complex was already abandoned back in the 5th, 6th or 7th century, as it was much easier to visit the River Jordan from Jerusalem, so it was easier to visit the West, not the East Bank. That's why most probably this Beth Abara, the word, is on the Western, not the Eastern side uh, of the river on the Madaba map. But there's also a very nice extra theory. There were those two fish in the Jordan River. There's a theory saying that they show the exact spot of baptism of Jesus. Anyway, what is really missing is not any Byzantine monastery. What is really missing is the River Jordan. Well, here we are finally going to see it. Of course, there are plenty of people who come here to symbolically get baptized in the river. Here's a baptismal bowl with some water from the river, if you prefer it that way, because I guess many people do. This is the River Jordan, or actually whatever is left of it. It is tiny, it is dirty, and this is today also a border between Israel and Jordan. And this is the Near East, this is not Schengen. Here, border is border. So you will notice there are kind of like lines in the river. You can enter only within the confines of it. Do not enter the river outside, as you're asking for trouble. I guess for many people, it doesn't matter, whatever I told you, this is still a sacred spot, the Jordan River itself. I guess for hundreds of years people would come here to get baptized in it. And it is actually the modern times that uh, made all those issues we see today. First of all, Israel, Syria, um, Jordan, they started building huge dams up the river or the little rivers that feed into the Jordan. This is how it used to look like even 80 years ago. And then after 67, after the Six Day War, 
it was pretty much a border of two countries at war, so they also mined uh, the surroundings. It is only after 94, the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel, where you can finally come here and work, for example, doing archaeology, and also build the modern churches. Although supposedly it is still not a good idea to stray off the official paths, as you may step onto something that you don't want to step onto. Anyway, it doesn't deter tourism from coming here. So, in front of you, a very nice modern um, tourist office. There is a little uh, museum, but more interestingly, I guess, you have photos of important visitors. Let's start with the president of the Republic of Adige. In other words, of course, a Circassian had to appear. But maybe more interestingly, you have a full view of how varied Christianity actually is. You have heads of all the different types of Christian churches. Some of them, I guess, we never heard of, like the Melkites that you have here. But this is also a place where I need to tell you about an issue. You saw that we had this nice minibus and all those um, passageways with shade and everything. But the tour itself was very rushed. We couldn't, of course, stray from the main paths because the border, the mines, and then it took actually a good half an hour to simply reach the Jordan River. But worst of all, we didn't have time at the very place of baptism. And mind you, I don't really care, I am an atheist, but I was really sorry for the religious people who, I guess, would love to stay there and contemplate such an important place for them. And I guess, this dove of peace did not have issues of being rushed anywhere. Now, don't get me wrong, it is still a place worth visiting, but um, I see space for improvement, and kind of a symbolic thing is this place. Those are the souvenir shops, or even more symbolic, the mosaics. Probably the most important visitor, the year 2000, John Paul II, came here, of course, and I think this mosaic is showing it, although I'm not sure if we are looking at JP2 or B16 or F1. <sighs> Those are not the finest examples of the art. So, let's leave the place of baptism and let's go back to Madaba. Because here, every couple of steps well, not literally, metaphorically speaking, but every couple of steps we will find an amazing mosaic. Especially 5th to 7th century, Madaba had its golden age. A very good example of it were the mosaics at Mount Nebo. If you have such an important sanctuary and you bring people from Madaba, it means Madaba had to have um, fame, simply. Was the fame only regional? or all of the Byzantine Empire knew of it. I don't know. True enough, though, there are still plenty of mosaics around. Some of them bigger, some of them smaller. Some of them better quality, some of them not so. Still, though, we do have plenty to see. So we are going to visit a couple of uh, museums and churches, as mosaics are an amazing example of both continuation and innovation. Now let's start with the topic of continuation. I keep repeating it and I will again here. When Rome fell, antiquity did not end. Here antiquity continues until roughly the conquest of Islam. And I say it because, although several hundred years of Christianity followed, still ancient themes and symbols are used here and already in front of you will be a very good example. Here is a ancient Greek satyr. Also, when I mention topics, one of them that keeps continuing during the Byzantine times is, let's call it, pastoral. You will have plenty of nature. Actually, this to me looks like poppy seed, although I think those are the pomegranate trees. Anyway, you will see plenty of animals and plants, which is an ancient topic which shows you the idea of abundance. But then in the middle, there is a medallion and unfortunately difficult to see from the stairs. So let's have a photo. This is Thalassa, which is ancient Greek personification of the sea. 
Here is also a little photo um, when it was discovered. Always nice to see such things. But let's jump to a different spot now and another example of continuation. So yes, you have again the animals. This time also not simply nature, but trying to control it. So hunting. More important here is the place itself. This is remains of an ancient villa from 5th, 6th century. And this is again continuation from ancient Roman pre-Christian times. You have an important wealthy family. They want to show off in their villa. They will have beautiful floor mosaics. And that continued on. Also with symbolism again, look at the bordure. So this kind of frame around mosaic proper, it has a shape that we associate today with a very bad ideology. But for ancient Greeks it was gamadion or tetraskelion, which was one of the symbols of good luck. It is very often found in ancient Roman pre-Christian mosaics, but this mosaic is from the 6th century and it was in a church. So obviously Byzantine Christianity assimilated, let's call them pagan symbols as well. But officially, the highlight and the best example of continuation is a mosaic that was most probably also in a private villa from the 6th century, but the owner of the place most probably connoisseur of ancient Greek tragedy from the classical times. Written by Euripides himself, 5th century before Christ, this is representation of a play called Hippolytus. In short, Hippolytus chose to live in chastity, which Aphrodite, the goddess of love, did not like at all, so she made Phaedra, his stepmother, fall in love with him with a tragic love. And here you have Aphrodite herself, with Adonis on the side, sending Eros to make Phaedra fall in love. That particular scene takes place in the countryside, we know because of Agrikis, peasant girl, representing it. And then below you have several people, among them in the middle, Phaedra herself. And that's it. The rest of the mosaic unfortunately did not survive. But there is something that did survive up in a corner. There is the goddess Tyche representing three cities. In the middle Gregoria. We still don't know where it used to be. Then Rome on the left. Well, that's obvious. And then to the right is Madaba itself. Yes, Madaba put itself on the level of Rome. Not bad, right? And today this representation is one of the official symbols of the city. You will find it on, for example, murals in urban space. But maybe the most important detail here is if there's a mosaic from the 6th century about an ancient Greek tragedy written a thousand years before and it's understood, this is still antiquity here. But enough of continuation, let's move to innovation. In order to do it, we have to go an hour east of Madaba, unfortunately with a bit of uh, bad weather, to a little village called today Um Al Rasas. Next to the village you will find another tell, but this one is empty. Nobody built anything here in modernity, so for archaeologists it's an amazing playground. They can just come here, dig uninterrupted and find amazing things. For us of course it's a pile of rubble, for them I think I can call it paradise. And among the things they found, well, I guess we can go straight to the highlight from here. They found pretty well preserved remains of most probably the main church of this place, Church of St. Stephen from the 6th century. And uh, the fundaments, actually parts of the walls are still here, but it's not about that. Guess what? Surprise, surprise, more mosaics were found. And actually, here's the first innovation. Of course, as we saw in a couple of examples, they keep using, like in the ancient Roman times, mosaics in private villas. But it's the Byzantine Empire that started using mosaics in sacred places, in churches, and uh, they became pretty much a compulsory piece in every Byzantine church. So they are not simply aesthetics anymore. I think I can say they become, uh, they become something quasi-sacred. So, they started adding new things to mosaics, like dedications. 
here's a medallion and there should be some kind of a dedication most probably um, for the building of the church but now let's move straight to the official highlight of the place till the very day the largest mosaic discovered in modern jordan work of only six artists and i think i should give you their names Stauragios, Euremios, Elias, Constantinus, Hermanus and Abdela. Those six amazing artists created what's in front of you and here's another piece of innovation. If they are so big, they have to think of perspective because you can see it as we are seeing it now from above but also you have to think of perspective of people who actually walk on it. It was a floor mosaic of a church after all. Now, we don't walk there anymore, although um, some cats do, and I hope they like what they see. Anyway, that is another innovation they have to think about. But also, another innovation, and we saw the best example at the very beginning, mosaics also become a geographical thing. They become maps. Map of Madaba is one thing we saw, but here we are going to see something similar. Not a map, but representations of the most important cities in the Holy Land. And we start with the Holy City itself. We start with Jerusalem. But let's continue and see the others as well. Neapolis is modern Nablus. Then you have not so well known Sebastis. And also not very well known today Caesarea. Well, that's because Caesarea did not survive its archaeological ruins. Now, they are famous. Then you have Diospolis, which is Lod in modern Israel, Eleutheropolis, which is a small village, Bet Jibrin next to Hebron, and then again, rather famous, Ascalon, Soashkelon, and Gaza itself. And this is basically, let's call it, the western side of um, the Dead Sea but of course there is the eastern side as well and it's on the other side of the mosaic here just three cities most important for us here you have Madaba itself of course then Philadelphia so it is modern Amman but maybe most important now for us because here we are is Castron Mefa'a when it comes to the first part of the name, Castron, let's jump out of the church for a second. And this pile of rubble around you used to be a Castron, so one of many castles in the Limes Arabicus, so the eastern desert um, frontier of the Roman Empire. And because they built this Castron in a small town called Mefaat, which was already mentioned in the Bible, hence the name Castron Mefa. Maybe most interesting, there's a column here in the representation of the city. And then, when you are in the ruins, in the background, on the horizon, there is a column. Let's go there now. And what we are going to see is not a simple column, it's a stellite tower. Between the 4th to roughly 7th, 8th century, it was in the Near East, a popular way of life for Christian ascetics. So they would be up there in the tower, isolated from the world. Well, not fully, if they become famous, and here you can see remains, there would be a monastery growing around them. I think the most famous today is Simeon the Stilite, but the one here had to be famous as well, not only because of the monastery that grew around him, but also because the tower is in the representation of the city itself. I'm sorry I'm kind of doing it very quickly here, but it started raining heavily as you saw when we were coming to see the tower. Anyway, last little bit, the tower, the mosaics, they are here untouched by modernity 1300 years, which is very important for um, one organization. The whole complex today is on the World Heritage List of the UNESCO. Let's go back to Madaba now for a moment because we are going to see another important innovation here. Now when it comes to geometrical designs, of course ancient Rome before Christianity would use it, but they were usually the bordures, so the uh, framing around mosaic proper. It is the Byzantine Empire that started using them, uh, the geometrical designs, as let's call it the 
actor itself and here you have most probably the most amazing geometrical mosaic in madaba mind you not only is the design uh, very complicated but the medallion in the middle is within a eight pointed star it looks kind of arabesque doesn't it well because this mosaic is from the 8th century yes a hundred years after the conquests of islam any doubts we are going to see the hippolytus uh, mosaic again it is 6th century and a meter lower which means 7th 8th century they built a church over it and just laid a new floor a meter above so that means the churches are built 100 years after conquest of Islam. Not enough, Greek is still used. It survives at least as sacred language. Probably it was actually spoken in Madaba still as a daily language of the town. So again, we are going to leave Madaba, this time quite a long way away, two hours to the east, to a place called Gasr Amra. Now, actually, it is visited usually from Amman. It is part of the desert castle loop. When we talked several episodes ago about Philadelphia, we visited two castles. So this is the third of them and most important one and has nothing to do with any castles. This is Baths. And I know many of you will say, wait a second, looks like Tatooine, I think, right? The desert planet from the Star Wars. It does look kind of weird, right? Here's a dome, here's like something else. It looks very much like experimental architecture, I would say. Well, if that was weird, let's enter the place. The first thing you are going to notice, plenty of frescoes everywhere around us, usually showing um, humans or animals, which probably would not be surprising if not for the fact that this place was built roughly in the middle of the 8th century by a prince from the Umayyad dynasty. In other words, this place was built by a Muslim prince and Islam is against images, isn't it? Well, Prince uh, Walid ibn Yazidi, who later became Caliph, uh, Walid II and here you should see him unfortunately the image did not survive well Prince Walid I think he had a different opinion on the topic of images right so first of all let's walk around a bit let's enjoy the ambience I'm gonna tell you about several particular frescoes later on but now let's concentrate for a moment on the topic of the Islamic conquest because very often we think like this conquest the new people came and the old people disappeared and the old world is gone well there were battles of course were there some massacres probably were some buildings destroyed probably but generally speaking the conquest wasn't exactly fully military there was confrontation yes but there was also plenty of cultural exchange and a very good example that we saw was this arabesque mosaic uh, in a Byzantine church but maybe more interesting is the fact that Islam borrowed a lot from the conquered peoples for example they kept the ancient Greek knowledge within their culture and as we can see around here they were also fascinated with a Byzantine art and culture the artists who worked here were most definitely Byzantine and uh, maybe even from Madaba itself, which, by the way, surrendered without a fight when Muslims came. So for Madaba, things haven't actually changed really. Now you pay your taxes to Damascus, not to Constantinople, but as me mentioned previously, Greek is at least still uh, in the sacred spots, the main language, most probably the language of the city. So life generally for Madaba didn't change that much. When it comes to the place where we are, were there more places like this? This is the only one we can visit today. Maybe there were more that didn't survive. Or maybe this is unique. Maybe an important prince could actually do something crazy like that without consequences. And mind you, the place is in the middle of the desert. Regular people could not simply come here and see such extravagance. Whatever the case, it is worth keeping in mind that when the Islamic conquest came, there was still 
for hundreds of years, plenty of cultural exchange between Muslims and Christians. Of course, there was confrontation, but maybe even more often, there was something I think I can call cooperation between them. But now, let's see some of the most interesting frescoes. Here is, most probably, Prince Walid himself in a bath, and next to him, some important supplicants. Emperor of the Byzantine Empire, Emperor of Persia, Emperor of Ethiopia, and Roderick, the last king of the Visigothic Kingdom in Spain. Unfortunately, didn't survive very well, the fresco. Here you have a typical hunting scene, of course, although my favorite animals, a bear playing a lute and a monkey clapping to the rhythm. Then you have important professions of regular people, some of them um, actually shown rather realistically, but also you do have some symbolism. Most probably this is a scene from a Greek myth, and not only the carib here is naked, there are quite a lot of naked women all around in the baths. Is it um, family life of the prince or are they Greek nymphs? No idea, but considering we are in a Muslim bath, well, Prince Walid was very open to new ideas, right? But official highlight is something else. The oldest surviving representation of the northern skies in a dome with constellations and signs of the zodiac but again unfortunately did not survive very well. This is my personal highlight. I imagine that this is the auto-portrait of the artist himself and it is time to leave this amazing place. I think, no surprises, another place Gasr Amra on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Now back to Madaba and we have a bit of an absurd situation. On the one hand we have an Muslim prince building baths full of images of animals and humans, some of them actually naked. On the other hand, a Christian emperor of the Byzantine Empire, Leo III, bans images. So what you've seen in front of you, those kind of holes that look like they should be humans or animals, that was not destruction of the Muslim conquerors. This is iconoclasm. So a movement um, in the 8th and 9th century in the Eastern churches, which was banning uh, images. And here it was actually rather popular. Some images did survive, like you see here, probably because they put something on top of it, but many did not. We saw some examples, we are going to see more. It was actually a very big deal. 8th, 9th century, there was something we can actually call a civil war over images in the Byzantine Empire. But here is a twist in the plot. We are not in the Byzantine Empire here. When iconoclasm started, Madaba, for more than a hundred years, already was in the Umayyad Empire. So, first of all, there must have been cultural connections between Madaba and the Byzantine Empire 100 years after the conquest, if iconoclasm was here. But here's another issue. What about relations between, between iconoclasm and Islam? Maybe it was Islam that heavily influenced iconoclasm. Or maybe the other way around. Maybe Islam was more relaxed on the issue of images and it is iconoclasm that influenced Islam. Or maybe both cultures started kind of competing which one will be more against images. I have of course no answers here, but the issue itself is super interesting. In the meantime, you can see a lot of iconoclasm. Usually they would do two things, either get rid of images by just taking out the pieces, leaving a hole or covering them with other pieces or with calcium. Fortunately, there was also some creative iconoclasm. Here they tried to cover up an animal with some kind of a lily, flor de lis or something. But my favorite is here. You have a nice tree, you have some kind of amphora. And then you look closer and you see suddenly two hind legs and a tail. There was a cow or a bull here and then it was nicely covered up with this um, tree. Well, it is iconoclasm, but hey, at least it is creative, right? Well, how are we doing? Are you tired of the mosaics already? We're gonna have a couple still coming, but now let's take a break. 
let's go to another place, another church, but not looking for mosaics, looking for a tower to get some nice views. The church is of decapitation of John the Baptist, um, which brings us to a very interesting symbolism here. I guess fish, that's not surprising, but the sword may be a bit more surprising to see on a church, plus you have the head of John the Baptist on a plate. Very particular, so our last trip outside of Madaba, this time a bit to the south. We are going to visit a place called Maherus or Maheront, which used to be a huge fortress of two Herods, the Great and Antipas. So for the last time, let me refer to the Bible. This time Gospel by Matthew. When Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, heard about Jesus, he said to his advisors, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That is why he can do such miracles. For Herod had arrested and imprisoned John as a favor to his wife Herodias, the former wife of Herod's brother Philip. John had been telling Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of a riot because all the people believed John was a prophet. But at a birthday party for Herod, Herodias' daughter performed a dance that greatly pleased him, so he promised with a vow to give her anything she wanted. At his mother's urging, the girl said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray. Then the king regretted what he had said, but because of the vow he had made in front of his guests, he issued the necessary orders. So John was beheaded in the prison and his head was brought on a tray and given to the girl who took it to her mother. Now, the party, the dance and the death of John the Baptist, all of it according to tradition, happened right here at Maheront Fortress. So I guess, first of all, the head of John the Baptist on a tray, now it's kind of obvious, but unfortunately from the place itself, well, nothing remains today, which is a pity, according to a modern visualization, this is how the place looked like during the time of Herod, which is, by the way, not his uh, doing. There was already a fortress here during the time of Hasmoneans, so in the first century BC, they created seven fortresses, of the seven Maheront was the only one east of the Dead Sea. And it wasn't actually to defend Jerusalem as the other six. It was here to give call to the other six on the other side of the, uh, of the Dead Sea if there is an enemy coming. Of course, it is on a steep hill, so it was also kind of easy to defend it. And as there is not much to see there today, let's concentrate on the views. And they are magnificent. The price to pay, very strong wind, and I think you can keep hearing it all the time in the background. So let's switch to photos, and um, I need to correct myself here. Actually, we didn't have very good views because of the fog and the such. We couldn't even see properly the western side of the Dead Sea. But in the end, actually, it played to our advantage because you have the clouds and sometimes suddenly there's a ray of sun falling. That gave the whole place a biblical feel. Here, I actually felt like talking face to face with God himself. And I'm not joking when I say me, an old atheist, a place like this does touch my soul. Vicky, of course, also found it spectacular, but she found another spectacular thing, the rocks. So she would enjoy the views afar, but also she would look uh, at things at hand. And mind you, those rocks are spectacular. So maybe in the future we are going to talk about this a bit more. But... Before we go, an extra detail, here they found the oldest mosaic in Jordan from the 1st century BC. And let's say goodbye to the fortress and the wonderful views. Let's go back to the church of the decapitation of Saint John the Baptist, who, by the way, is considered today the holy patron of Madaba and all the Christians in Jordan. I said when we were approaching the church, we are looking for a tower. 
as you can see we are in it right now going up i have to say it is a bit narrow but hey we're going up together and then when we arrive at the top that's the entrance and then that's the balcony so my vertigo basically let me do just this vicky stayed outside she is the brave one and i um happily waited inside the tower thank you very much so the views you're gonna get now that's the hand of vicky and let me use this panorama for a couple of statistics today roughly five percent of jordan are christians madaba is considered kind of an unofficial christian capital of jordan because 90 to 95 percent of the old town are christians of the old town that's roughly 14,000 people but as you can see the place has grown in the re recent decades so madaba as such plus surroundings it's today 120,000 people most of them of course today are muslims and you can see through let's call it kind of a symbol there is a big mosque uh, in the old town today but once again people do live here in peace and i have to say all the madabians i guess i can say are very proud of the ancient roots and everything that is to visit today some of the guides we had showing us the mosaics were muslims so once again it is back to cooperation between christians and muslims very good plus another thing that we need to talk about is how you keep them mosaics alive of course it's not an easy task and before you say huh they're kind of lazy aren't they no we were there where when they were having a break those people are not lazy though it is a lot of work to prepare the mosaics for us and we've seen them beautiful now you're gonna see a couple of mosaics that are still waiting because before you clean them like here you see you had to get rid of all the um, layers of modernity and then you start cleaning it is a lot of work and my guess is both the christian and muslim madabians are doing that hard work for us plus madaba today is again on the rise a center of mosaics unfortunately the place where we are was close to the uh, to the street and the audio is not very good so i will have to provide the commentary but here you have industrially prepared um, limestone so it's cut into small pieces as you can see that's a definitely a professional hand right there then you use glue which is simply flour a special type of flour mixed with water and then you apply it but you apply it as in a mirror image then when it's ready you turn it around leave it in the sun for two days then you clean it and you've got a mosaic this is the old style but there is the new style as well and it uses for example plastic it uses um, industrial yellow glue so it is a faster technique because there's no mirror imaging there's no drying in the sun it is pretty much direct work here you have a copy of the madama map in case you're wondering how much time it takes four months three people six hours of work per day and you think that's crazy here's some good audio for a change how long does this, it take to make six, it the six month six months Six, six month two personal six hour day yeah so now the most difficult question yeah this, uh, this how uh, much is it this is special this is special piece so how much is it uh, price uh-huh this 2015 two and a half thousand dinners he meant that's roughly three thousand dollars is that your face right now well there are cheaper things to buy if you wish old style two days roughly 20 bucks new style up to a week 40 bucks but the most important one here is another very important symbol of the city the madaba tree and here's the funny bit with all the mosaics i showed you today uh, i forgot to actually find this mosaic fortunately there are copies everywhere and not only as mosaics as murals as well well it is one of the symbols of the city after all if you want something more modern 
there are options as well but here we are going to say goodbye to the workshop we wish them all the best and uh, we are going to slowly start finishing our episode before we do though let me also mention with all the mosaics we've seen today madaba is simply a very nice town it is relaxed i mean touristic but relaxed it's not as crazy as amman for example you have all the small labyrinthine um, streets to wander around it does have a very nice feel and uh, of course we didn't have time to uh, relax with all those places we wanted to visit so imagine after a full day or two of mosaic craziness you need to rest a bit so what do we do we go to a nice restaurant how do we pick it you ask it's very simple actually wherever we see caracale we are there so with this shameless piece of product placement yes we are going to say good night to madaba i am not going to say good night to you to you i am going to say see you very soon we have plenty more adventures before us some of the adventures are expected and some were rather unexpected still i am going to see you very soon so thank you very much for now and catch you later <laughs>